Jesus, I am so glad that we get to gather and worship you together. Um, that, that verse we just sang, it comes straight out of Psalm 23. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me. That word follow, it's translated, is pursue us. And so some of us are yeah, even here right now in need of your pursuit. And what I'm about to preach is a confrontational message. <laughs> and it may not feel like love, uh, but by your spirit, would you move in a powerful way to cut through the chaos and the crap of our lives so we can meet you face to face, confront our sin and do business with you to enjoy that restoration and tension of your sacrificial love displayed on the cross. So move in power as we go into your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the last prophet, John the Baptist. Feel free to open up to Luke uh, 3, and that's where we're going to kick it off. But um, have you ever had to confront someone that you cared about? How did, how did that go? Oh, my goodness. Is there anything harder in life than confronting someone that you love? Because you're faced with this decision in this moment, do I really love them more than I love myself? Because in my desire to save this relationship, I might love myself so much that I don't ever do what I'm called to do. But if we love, we will confront. I remember when I was working in manufacturing, I had the very unenviable position of being in middle management, which means your boss uh, is unimpressed with your performance and your employees hate you <laughs> because you betrayed them. Uh, you used to be one of them. Uh, and it's, it's, it's an interesting place to become a man, let me just say that. Um, but I had an employee once, and he, uh, he, was, not, he was not performing very well. And uh, he would take these like three to 30 minute smoke breaks, kind of walking back in the various graveyard. If you've ever been in a manufacturing plant, you know, there's all these extra parts and jigs and things. And, and, uh, and the disciplinary time came around to do a performance review and have the write up and the whole, you know, this isn't a good direction. We need to change some things. Well, lo and behold, a couple months Later now, and now I'm working at Youth for Christ, his son is in my ministry, and he is still a terrible employee, and I have to fire him. And so you feel this weight, this, this crushing weight on your soul, and you call them in, and like you might imagine, the first response of this conversation was one of scoffing, like, are you serious? Like, you're a, you're a little punk, you're not going to do this to me, you know, he's older than me. Um, and of course, that, that scoffing quickly turns into uh, anger, and then threats, and then slam doors, and the loudest exit you could imagine from the premises. And it's difficult. And I, I, I find myself being drawn back to that because warnings are issued as an extension of grace, unless you're not willing to hear them. Warnings are an extension of grace. And the prophet's task is to call back the wondering by exposing them to their sin so they can return to the loving faithfulness of God. And that's what we're going to catch when we watch a man in the wilderness today. John 3, starting in verse uh, 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria, and uh, Trachonitis, and Lysanias, during the, um, sorry, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, 
Who warned you to flee from that wrath of, that is to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, Oh, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threat or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, and the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, he added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. As with uh, the advent of our Savior, uh, today's section opens by setting the scene at a sort of... uh, uh, to, to, to frame kind of the who's in power and what's going on in the world. And so to today, the word of the Lord coming to John in the wilderness is met with that kind of uh, epic buildup for the moment that we are here. And he lists this who's who of global, national, regional, and religious leaders signaling something new is unfolding. And all these prevailing powers, maybe they're unaware, but they are historically present to witness this moment when the prophetic message of John the Baptizer goes public. Uh, when Evan and I uh, used to play cards, or uh, cars, uh, we would sometimes play like cops and robbers with these cars, right? And so there'd be this bandant of rebels, you know, usually the trucks with the mud on them, souped up, maybe some of the, you know, some of them maybe had guns on them. And, uh, and we would uh, advance them in this high-speed chase up over the pillow top mountains to their hideout behind. And uh, inevitably, to catch them, we had to leave behind eventually and come back to this, this supercar squad car set. You know what I'm talking about, the Lamborghinis with lights. Don't understand that thing. But anyways, we had to come back to them and help them catch up and try to bust these do no gooders. No, do no good, do no gooders. We'll go with it. And in the same way, uh, authors have a unique challenge because we had to leave one behind, right? We we don't have. There's only so many hands for all 700 cars, and you have to leave some behind. And authors have this same. Um, challenge and privilege when they tell uh, the story in their words. They have to advance because everybody knows there's a complexity that happens in anybody's life at any given time, but the pieces, the storyteller must advance them sort of one perspective at a time. And we find that here today. Uh, The perspective is unfolding one at a time. We've just spent time seeing Jesus come and uh, Jesus in the temple, and we've been following the development of the Messiah. But we return back to John right where uh, Luke left him. Just like me and Evan playing cars, we come back to where he left him. In Luke 1, at the very end, it says the child John grew. He became strong, and he went to the wilderness until the day of his public appearance. Today, we're told, the word of the Lord came to John, a son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Having grown up 
become strong in spirit. The time had come. John in the wilderness waiting, keeping watch for the launching of his big moment. The one that had been promised and prophesied about. Waiting in the wilderness. You ever been there? Waiting in the wilderness. This is where many would-be faithful ministers go missing. I don't wish to make a major point because I think it minors in our text, um, but to those of you who are experiencing weariness in seasons of waiting, uh, I want this to be an encouragement to you because the Spirit of the Lord will find you even in your seasons that are dry, seasons marked with waiting, seasons marked with discouragement, seasons marked with a lack of clarity that would sure be helpful. The Spirit of the Lord will come and sustain a dear brother of mine uh, in a former season of ministry was always chomping at the bit for ministry. He was so passionate, ready to go. Um, but he had a hard time, maybe with some of the smaller things in life. And so it seemed like the Lord was kind of prompting me to do that confrontational thing he sometimes does for people who hate confrontation. And to walk alongside and say, maybe the Lord is giving you this season to be faithful with your family of six. Maybe this is a place... To do ministry where we can see it, to show faithfulness to the Lord, to prepare us for the ministry that we can't yet see. And waiting, often in the wilderness, is where the Lord will find the faithful and then send them about his business. So if you're waiting, lean in, wait some more, and meet with the Spirit who comes to those who wait. You know, I've just explained this in really common and generic terms for us. But make no mistake, there was nothing common about the waiting and the word of the Lord that comes to John. This was a specific calling. He'd been set apart before birth to fulfill the promises made by God's people through Malachi and Isaiah specifically, to go in the spirit and the power of Elijah of old, to turn the hearts of God's people back towards the Lord. And this would be a signal that the Lord was on the move yet again, and again, moving with salvation intentions. That's why Luke incorporates this big chunk in the middle, starting at four through six. Uh, this is a, a big uh, piece brought forward from the prophet Isaiah, telling us all about what this moment will be. He says, this is the deal. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is who John is embodying. This is the message he's been given, one of repentance. And he will cry out in the wilderness, and this is what it will accomplish, to prepare the way for the Lord, making paths straight. Every valley will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight. The rough become level. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. Luke makes clear this ministry of John the Baptist is certain fulfillment that God is moving and has salvation intentionality. And this is a ministry that will pave the way for the salvation of all. The imagery is marvelous. It, it imagines God being separate from the people he desires to save. That landscape is roughshod and, 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 and dangerous and there is no way to make passage. How then will the people be saved? This is the, what's being begged of this concept. And so then John the Baptist comes, and we're, we're made to understand it's his message that makes that way straight. The things that separate God from his salvation efforts will be made straight by a message coming from the last prophet. For the word of the Lord has come. And the word of the Lord, by the way, uh, the word of the Lord is code. This is, this is, this is standard issue, um, uh, uh, technical phrase brought forward from the Old Testament, meaning whatever is about to come, when the word of the Lord speaks, this is no longer to be understood as the language of somebody doing their level best, but as a direct conduit, a direct passageway of God's direct message for his people. And so we see, again, this is what happens. God's word has come, and it is loud, it is clear, and it is hot off 
the press. And in case you're unconvinced, this is how several books of the Old Testament start. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, and then what follows is the rebuke. Micah 1.1, the word of the Lord came to Micah of Morsheth. And then Joel 1.1, the word of the Lord came, oops, I copied and pasted. The word of the Lord came to Joel. You understand here that this is a technical term bringing before our eyes, front and center, the last prophet. You know, like, Micah, that sounds a little dramatic. Shouldn't this be an Indiana Jones episode or something like that? But no, seriously, he is the last prophet. This is the last time you're going to hear this introductory phrase, uh, the, the word of the Lord came. Because the next prophet comes as the prophet, the priest, and the king. He doesn't come having heard a word, but as the word, the word made flesh, who made his dwelling among us. And so John the Baptist, the last prophet, prophet is given this particular ministry to pave the way so that obstacles could be removed so that salvation can come. And what is the message that levels the field? Repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. What will adequately prepare an audience whose interests are piqued by this weird-looking man who emerged from the wilderness? Baptized, the symbolic activity of cleansing illustrated for the forgiveness of sin on account of having repented. To be clear, when John does this along the, sea, uh, the Jordan River's banks, there was no precedent for this. This is not to be understood as the ceremonial cleansing that went with the services and the typical uh, temple activities for purification rites. He's on the banks of the Jordan in the wilderness just north of the Dead Sea. He's nowhere near the temple. There's no association with what happens there. This is a, a, a at the core, once for all, a moment in the uh, time where the, the, the baptism occurs to demonstrate alignment with conviction of sin and forgiveness from God. There's a shelf life granted to this ministry, to this message, to this specific people to prepare the way for Jesus. So what can we learn from this description of the word of the Lord? Well, implicitly, there's a people prepared that will not scorn an offensive message that warns them of their sin. A prepared people will see that God's wrath against sin can actually be avoided. It can be forgiven. A people prepared will respond rightly with repentance. We'll unpack that word in a minute. And so, John preached, and the crowds came. Not one to mince words. John left out the soft and humorous sermon hook that I like to use. He opted instead for, you brood of vipers. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that's coming? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You brood of vipers. On the soft end, this is a, a euphemism for those people who showed up and their actions weren't any kind of display of what was going on inside of their hearts. And so he's calling them, you a dangerous, venom-filled, dangerous lot of hypocrites. In fact, this is a charge that Jesus is going to use in his own ministry, right? But on the extreme end, the serpent is Satan. And so the brood of vipers is a brood of special descent. You might say the spawn of Satan. Ouch. That stings. And yet this is the description of all stuck in sin, isn't it not? 
the prince of the power of air. We were all once walking under his influence as children of disobedience, children of wrath. Oh, man, that stings. And yet this is kind of what truth does. Truth exposes sin. And when the truth exposes sin, you need to understand that that exposure is an action of God's grace. In fact, it's so interesting. Did you catch, as we read through the, the whole kind of text, verse 18, with many other exhortations. So we're only getting a, a sliver of this pie. But with many other exhortations, he told them other good news. Like, what? <laughs> the brood of vipers introduction is the introduction to good news. We need to become accustomed then uh, to, to what and how God might get our attention because he's calling it good news. And sometimes I think, am I, am I missing something? But if sin warrants wrath, then exposing sin is an action of God's mercy. And it would seem that knowledge of wrong, follow what he's doing in the text, knowledge of wrong doesn't automatically result in preferring that which is right. In fact, how many times have you heard people say, I know where I'm going when I die. Satan and I are going to party. We're going to have a good old time. See, knowledge is only so useful. Even the demons believe in God and shudder. But when the truth exposes your sin, friends, this becomes your opportunity to be set free from sin if you repent. And apparently, this offensive tone is the tool that God is using through John to wake them up. Because apparently there's a familiarity with the content that betrays self-deception. You can be so familiar with the things of God that you're unmoved to actually obey them. So when the truth exposes sin... I guess it begs the question, how will you respond? Will you make excuses and feign innocence? Pretend that whatever charge might be coming after, uh, the root problem in your heart is probably misfounded, and I'm better than most. Will you run from cover just to get outside of that circumstance or that voice that is echoing in your ear with your guilt? Will you run and survive another day, leaving sin waiting behind the next turn? Conviction long in the dust. Or will you surrender to the truth that you, you need a Savior? That you are guilty. That you need pardon through repentance. I want to define repentance because it's a word you're going to hear quite a bit in the church. Other people describe it different ways. I'm no way saying that this is the best way to do it, but I think it's a way that can be helpful. The word metanoia throughout the New Testament literally means to change your mind. So I might have said I was going to have eggs this morning for breakfast, but I repented and I had cereal instead. It doesn't make eggs sinful. That's not what I'm saying. So it's not speaking specifically to the turning from sin in its uh, usefulness as a word. But in the biblical context, that's almost always what it's doing. It's a technical turn that changes your mind. And so what I want to explain to you is the three-part dynamic of repentance. You can imagine somebody going down a way stopping going this way, making a turn, and now going this way. I'm going to keep coming back to that. It's a three-part turn, and that might help us make sense of it. Changing mind, changing direction, changing action, okay? So first of all, changing your mind. Since sin is an offense to a holy God, it puts us in this position of being separated from God and under the impending death consequence, the wrath of God for our sin. In this sinful pathway, when we're awakened to see it for what it is, this becomes a pathway we no longer wish to travel. That unwanted exposure to sin might be what saves your life. 
And then you might even see with it in that holy moment the compound consequences of your sinfulness. The pain and the brokenness of the sinfulness of others that you're reaping that harvest in your life. Or the guilt that comes when you see for yourself the sins that you have piled up and the pain that you have caused. It's a fork in the road. And it only comes by the Holy Spirit who works conviction in the heart. The same scenery I've seen day in and day out, I'm suddenly awakened to see it for what it is, and the fork in the road emerges, and now I have a choice to be made. So in this moment, I'm going to change my mind about going the direction of sin. But then I also need to change direction. This is an orientation then toward that which is true, which is right. If, if going right is wrong and going left is right, that's confusing. But I need to repent then and turn towards righteousness. I need to make a shift. This is where the process of transformation in so many is cut short because it's not enough on its own. As if we could slip our moral drivetrain into neutral, point our vessel toward that which is good, right, and true. But there's no such thing as neutral in the current laden seas of life. And as it is, all such drifting will not be towards Christ, but away from Him. It's the issue that John the Baptist is bringing up with cutting clarity, the forefront of this Jewish people's minds. They might be tempted to think that as Jews, they are children of Abraham. They were born in to this blessing. That they've arrived already. John's saying that's just one two-bit charade that only deceives you if you think you can shout amen to my sermon but not walk this thing out in obedience. No, biblical repentance continues from changing our mind, changing direction, and then changing our actions so that an ethical shift takes place, a movement into moral living that resembles the very holy character of God himself. John's words wake us up to the simple fact that the primary barrier for the religiously inclined, it's not understanding, it's obeying. It's walking it out in obedience. The doing that follows the knowing, that's what demonstrates that faith is actually present. Biblical repentance requires three moves. Changing your mind. Stopping that evil momentum, changing your direction, moving towards God and godliness, changing actions as you engage in obedience and that godliness is reproduced. Don't miss how profound and helpful this is, this message as we seek to live lives of godliness. I promise you, your coming to Christ is not the end of your being confronted with your sin. No one says amen. <laughs> But man, how many obstacles show up in our lives that make repentance hard? Sin gets exposed and that pride rears its ugly head, right? What? I can't do wrong. Oh, but what sweet humility marks and accompanies those who repent, who know they're capable of quite evil things and cling to Jesus to walk in goodness. Offense, what? They did me wrong. Ah, but what sweet healing and forgiveness accompanies repentance. Guilt, how's that one for an obstacle? I am wrong, and I'm too far gone. Ah, but what innocence and freedom accompanies repentance. And the result of this response to sin's exposure is the freedom of forgiveness. It's a head start to receive fully the Messiah who is coming, or in our case, who's waiting and present and active in our midst. And make no mistake that this offensive message uh, is for all. Because 
Isaiah ends his quote here in verse 6, so that all will see the salvation of God. It's an explicit promise that has been implicitly laid out over the course of today's text. For who responds? The crowds, practicing Jews, tax collectors, the defected and rejected Jews, and soldiers, either enemy Gentiles or Jewish recruitments, probably fitting in the same category as tax collectors. The crowds asked him, what do we do? And he answered, if you got two tunics, share with one who has none. If you got food, do likewise. I love that. So what do you do? He doesn't say, what's that? Have a potluck. potluck. Lord, help me bear fruits in keeping with repentance. (laughs) Oh, that's so funny. Yes, but he says to do it in your house. Because if you only have enough food for two, and you're only one, give that one away. I love this. It's not go obey all the Ten Commandments, all those do nots, do that. Avoid all that. He says, no, live out the heart of the law. Live out the heart of God himself that overflows with generosity and hospitality. And I love it. If you've got two, give one. What does that mean? You don't need much to be generous. The lie of materialism is you need more to be generous. Tell that lie to shut up. Whatever you have is enough to be generous. I promise you. To the tax collectors, he says, be baptized. Oh, sorry, they come to be baptized. He says, they say, teacher, what do we do? By the way, I love the desperation in all these categories because when the Spirit of God cuts with clarity, exposing your junk, you know you're accountable. You you know you're on the hook. What do we do? How do we bear fruit in keeping with repentance? By the way, that's what's expected. So it says the tax collectors came and were baptized, meaning they have had that turn. They've had that plunging into the waters to receive this as a change moment. But now what do we do for acting this obedience out? What do we do? How do we put fruit on this dying tree? How do we bring it to life? To the tax collectors, he says, collect no more than you're authorized. What? Not resign from your post, you dirty traitor? Go learn an admirable trade? No, just collect the taxes of your countrymen with honesty, which is implied you will continue to bear the dishonor and hostility of your countrymen. Stay in your post and do it with integrity. Ugh. That stings a bit. Okay, bear fruit. Soldiers, what should we do? He says, do not extort money from anyone by threat or false accusation and be content with your wages. Whether these be enemy Gentiles, they're themselves cut. It seems possible that there weren't as many like troops um, occupying. It's possible that there were Jewish enlistments who were hired by Herod as muscle, which makes them kind of like tax collectors sort of like traitors in the midst, right? But in either case, he doesn't say convert to Judaism, you pagan Roman scum. He doesn't say take on a more humane and honorable task, you Jewish betrayer. He says be content with your wage. Don't bully. Don't bribe. Leave the cruel privileges that have been given to you by this post, leave those behind. It just all seems like it's not that big of a deal to share one little item of bread or to just stay put. And yet, and yet it's so much for those making those first efforts of faithfulness. Somewhere in the midst of this message, perhaps some of us have been thinking, but Micah, as soon as you add works, haven't we moved away from salvation by grace? And that's an interesting question which seems already to have been answered is that the nature of your faith will be exposed in your works. And without the works, you ought not be believing you have any sort of faith.
In fact, it seems like the way he brings charge against people and the way he encourages these who respond that if righteous works don't follow, what all we're seeing is the fruit of unbelief. We're seeing the fruit of unbelief. And it itself, the fruit of your unbelief, ought to do what this is doing. It ought to be a mirror warning you. Warning you that if transformation is promised and transformation is missing, you are in trouble. It's a holy moment when the mirror meets your face and you see the junk that remains. Because we don't want to redefine faith, do we? Because as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. So Luke illustrates the proper response so that all can come. The assumption is that when your sin is exposed, you have an opportunity to turn from your sin. You see it and you respond with remorse. You change your mind, change your orientation. You embrace and accept the outward sign of baptism as a display that heart change is taking place. And then he's telling these people, then live, put actions of obedience into practice. Live out godliness in your daily life. And then he continues on. As the people were in expectation, all were questioning their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. And John answered, saying, I baptize you with water, oh, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. As you might expect, this electric message of the divinely authorized messenger stirs rumors, stirs wonderings of John's role in God's plan. Oh, but his response is so good, isn't it? That the one who comes next is so categorically different. He is so much mightier. John wants to remove himself entirely from the spectrum of spiritual importance referring to himself as even lower than the servant who has the dutiful task of undoing the sandals. No, no, no. John is not a colleague. John is not a disciple. John isn't even a servant. We have ran out of room, folks, on the organizational chart for the gap, the span between John and Jesus. And so to answer the question of the curious masses, he says, I am not the Christ. How will we know the Christ? He'll be coming with fire in both of his fists. Binary fire. I, I joked uh, with, with Karen that it almost sounds like a juvenile novel. <laughs> Binary fire in the haunting case of the missing middle. If that was over your head, I'm sorry. I'm a nerd. I wish I didn't speak in code. Seriously, I try to say things simply, and it just comes out with complexity. And so do your best to keep up with me. But what I want you to understand is, is this. In light of John's message and his messianic deflection, he's deflecting those titles. What he's saying is fire is coming, and now is the time to respond. This is not a wait and see how it plays out. This is not, uh, well, well, let's just deal with biz do business with God later. How many far from God have heard about God and said, on my deathbed, I'll sort this all out? And the witness was missing in the moment of that last breath. Jesus is coming, and he's coming with fire. He will later declare, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There's no middle ground. Jesus comes bearing fire in both of his fists, the fire of his baptism and the Holy Spirit filling, his consuming presence, the continued flame for the believers refining. And he comes with the eternal fire of his wrath, for the persistent 
stuck in their sin, unrepentant, who disregard the warning as brought. All binary fire means is that there's no middle. We live in a postmodern generation where we want as many categories as possible to avoid this cutting clarity. Either I'm in with Jesus or I'm out. Either I've got him or I don't. And that Jesus-ish, Jesus only. This is an exclusive claim. And there is urgency. For the axe has been laid to the root of the tree. As 2 Corinthians 6 quotes from the Old Testament, if you hear the word, today is that day of salvation. Don't let your heart be hardened by the concept of turning tomorrow or after the next thrill. Turn today. Because the message that exposes sin is a message of grace, but it will not be received by all. Because the message that exposes sin sometimes will offend, and it might even enrage. Like the gentleman I let go that fateful day at work. And when power is held in the hands of the pagan, that prophetic message that calls the sinful man who takes his brother's wife as his own to repent, he uses that power to silence, to put on mute the prophetic messenger. Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, silences John, adding to all of his woes the imprisonment of John the Baptist. And it's a harrowing warning, friends, that not all who hear this call will heed the warning and repent. And this is the end in Luke's gospel to the ministry of John. Today's text, 3 verse 1, it opens up with John's prophetic moment. And it closes with John's prison sentence. So let not the warning of John's words be lost on you. The truth that exposes your sin is your opportunity to be set free if you repent. And faith properly fixed on the person and work of Jesus will bear the fruit of faithful living in everyday life. And friends, salvation and sanctification both hinge on this principle. Every conviction is an opportunity for faith to flourish in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And this is so important. One of the things I say so often to people, especially if they're self-condemning over sins that are still present, is that we need to embrace the fact that our saying yes to Jesus, that initial time, is not our arrival at what he has planned for us. You, friend, are in a process. And every exposure of your sin is not opportunity for shame, but for repentance and growth, magnifying the very one who alone can set you free. Not just from the death consequence, but the continued enslavement to that sin. Praise be to God. (laughs) And this is important for us because like the curious crowds who were called out on the banks of the Jordan, you and I are at risk of thinking that we have arrived. Thinking we've attained something already. But when our salvation assumptions get called into question by continued sin in our lives, I promise you, when we look back to weigh our good deeds and bad, there is not going to be a lot of confidence in that if we look back with an honest scale. Perhaps your parents wrote down in your Bible the day you decided and raised your hand and Jesus went into your heart, I promise you, very few have true assurance from that. It's not sufficient data to restore the hope of your salvation. 
But friend, if you embrace every doubt, every sin conviction as your opportunity for faith, each moment magnifies the Savior as you grow. It's adopting a posture of continued maturity in the process. And I promise it's far too much. The assurance of your salvation is far too much to entrust to aging pen in the beginning of your Bible or your own feelings or your own fears. It's a return to the good news about Jesus that you need. And so let's learn together from today's text. Yes, you have a mess of sin. Even as believers, you'll see things that stink about your life, and that sin will stand as a witness to condemn you. You need to look that sin square in the eyes. You need to say, this is my sin. Experience the remorse. Experience the guilt. Embrace the truth of its conviction. Oh, but friend, do not stay there. (laughs) Turn to the cross. Look at what Jesus did, who he is, and what he has accomplished as the sent son of God to save sinners. Because on the cross is where sin meets its ultimate match, and the sinner is offered a pardon. Because Jesus is our substitute. And repent and believe. Change your mind about the sin and the destruction it is causing now and will cause eternally if you do not turn. Turn, change your direction. Stop running from God, start running to Him. Change your actions then that align with His will, walking now in obedience, entrusting yourself completely to Jesus who saves, the Spirit who fills you, is with you, and who walks you into joy-filled obedience with your sin record erased, your guilt relieved, and your relationship to God restored. And rest assured, That faith, properly fixed on the person and work of Jesus, will bear fruit. And your life will be abundantly declaring how good your Savior is. Thank you, Jesus, for this word. Thank you for the cutting clarity of the gospel that we need so much. Thank you that it rightly divides us and it shows us what we don't want to see. But in that same moment, it reminds us that the goodness and the grace of God can be ours through faith. If you're here today and you don't know where you stand with God, I wonder if in your own mind, address him. Address him now and do business. God, I know. I know that I have a sinful past and a sinful heart I know my life is a mess, and I need help. I trust Jesus as the Son of God to be my Savior, who paid for my sin, who grants new life through the power of his own resurrection, and fills me fully with the Holy Spirit. And I choose now to walk in obedience with you.